Hey everybody, uh, my name is Jordan Haberfield. Uh, I am a practice leader for DRG Search, a uh, firm that's been involved in uh, executive search and consulting for nonprofit organizations for well over 30 years. Uh, I work across a number of practice areas, but uh, I do a lot of work in technology and digital transformation. So uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm excited to have uh, a friend of mine, Christina Villarini, uh, joining me today to talk uh, about digital strategy. Uh, Christina is the digital director uh, for Lambda Legal. Uh, Lambda Legal is a wonderful organization. If you don't know about them, they uh, are really on the front lines uh, fighting every day for recognition of civil rights for the LGBT community, people living with uh, HIV. Uh, and uh, it's obviously in today's environment, it's a daily struggle, uh, constant uh, litigation, education, fighting for public policy. Uh, so Christina, thank you so much for joining me. I know we've been talking about this for a while, so I'm, I'm glad you're joining me. Yeah, no, this is super exciting. Um, and thanks for the intro, Jordan. I hope that this is helpful for uh, a bunch of your clients and a bunch of potential folks who are thinking about tackling digital challenges in the, in the 21st century. I hope so, too. And, and I know we have a half hour, which obviously we can cover everything that has to do with digital technology in a half hour, but uh, we'll do our best. Um, so just to start, um, why don't you tell me a little bit about from from Lambda Legal's perspective, what does it mean to be living in a digital culture and uh, supporting Lambda Legal from that perspective? Sure. So, I mean, on the digital side, um, I'm the director of the digital vertical, which is housed in communications at Lambda Legal. Um, so there's three verticals housed in the communication department here. It is digital, it is marketing, and it is comms more traditionally known as like earned media um, and sort of pitching for, you know, the New York Times and WAPO and, and those types of those types of presses. Sure. Um, on the digital side, uh, I've built a team of five incredible folks um, specializing in everything from multimedia and content generation um, to posting on the web and posting on social um, to a deputy digital director who supports me um, in creating and overseeing those those particular implementations um, from the from the perspective of Lambda Legal, we know that we have kind of a large team and most organizations don't have the bandwidth or the capacity to have, you know, five people taking on digital. Well, I think that's one of the unique things about the social media culture we live in now, right? The digital media. You don't have to have a huge team to get the mm -hmm. word out. So how does how does Lambda Legal leverage that? How do they use, you know, all the different avenues of social media in order to, to get their message across and educate the public? Sure. So I think um, when you're thinking about building a digital culture in your organization, I think the way that I've tried to solve for this at Lambda is that you're thinking about two things. You're thinking about how do we embrace and encourage experimentation in the digital space and kind of em embracing it as a real vertical that's not gonna go away. So how are you creating content and, and strategizing around it? Um, and just to remind folks, digital includes, you know, mobile web, um, social, streaming, all of those those channels um, are considered digital. So so you're it's a big sandbox to play in. Um, so you also wanna have people that are on the hook for those channels, right? Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is an extension of like, how are we factoring digital into the organizational outcomes and the things that we are trying to accomplish every day under the umbrella of our mission and our values? Right. So when I'm trying, you know, Lambda's mission for 45 years is to bring full equality to LGBTQ folks and everyone living with HIV through the means of impact litigation, public policy, and public education. So how does digital factor into how we do that? So there's a lot of different ways that we try and solve for those two things, but when you're thinking about a, a digital framework for your organization, those are the two things you probably wanna focus on. Does it make a difference? Do you differentiate between all the different social mediums in how you and what you're getting across to the public? Does Facebook differ from Instagram or Twitter in, in getting that message across? 
A hundred percent. You you want to be platform specific, which is why uniquely I'm not a digital strategist who's going to tell uh, organizations or friends who are trying to build up their own brands um, in the digital space. I'm not going to tell you to produce a hundred pieces of content a day. That doesn't seem like intuitive and it doesn't solve for what you're trying to get across. I think you have to figure out based on the data that is very public and widely available, what is the platform for you and what's gonna drive the types of things that you're going for? Is it acquisition? Is it more of a two-way conversation? If you're just mass producing content, that's a one-way conversation. You're not going to drive the kind of engagement that you're looking for and you're not gonna get an ROI that is valuable. Um, so you wanna have a different strategy on Facebook. Right now, Facebook is skewing a lot older and it's not growing. Right now, Instagram is growing and is skewing younger. Um, you know, Snap is kind of stagnant and like kind of thinking about how they're going to work with larger brands. So there might be opportunities for brands to, to kind of jump in and, and set the table there. There's different ways that you can leverage and some content doesn't perform. You know, it, the, the algorithms and, and the nature of the marketplace changes all the time. Um, you're at the mercy of your audience. You're also at, your, at the mercy of the platform. So that's the challenge with working with platforms. When they change something or they decide that, you know, the cost per acquisition is now going to be five dollars. If you're if you don't have the budget to do that, you're, you're you can't play the game anymore. Sure. So it's important that you're thinking about how to leverage social to reach new people within capacity, within bandwidth of, of what your organization is able to do, but also how am I building up my own website? How am I building out my own blog? How am I building out my own medium so that people are familiar with who we are and what we're doing if Facebook and Instagram and Twitter were to shut down tomorrow? Right, no, that makes sense. So do you, do you in your mind, have a difference between when you're trying to educate the public versus having that donate now button on mm -hmm. the screen and, and as a fundraising, just obviously, you know, digital transformation, digital media is a, is a development effort. It's a fundraising effort as well. So is, is that always in play when you're, when you're posting? More often than not, it sounds really corny, but more often than not, when we are responding to a particularly terrible moment in our communities or the communities that we serve, we raise more money not asking we raise more money by showing up yeah. than we do when we make a hard ask. It, it just yeah. continues to be the case, at least as you know, my examination of, of Lambda's behavior and performance. Sure. sure, and I've seen that. So you know, uh, Lambda has some great videos um, talking about um, U.S. service members, you know, who are HIV positive fighting for their rights or trans youth. Um, getting rights just to simply use a restroom. I, I see the videos and they're they're very um, uh, engaging, right? And just having the videos up there are enough. Is is there a difference in your mind when you are posting to use videos, which are you know probably more of a more expensive to put sure. together than just simply posting a picture uh, online? Because obviously that's a lot easier for a lot of smaller organizations to to implement. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways to kind of hack the way to do this. I think one of the things that's incredible about um, the the world that we're in from the digital space is that there's a lot of access to resources and content um, creators and freelancers and people who are doing this work, and, you know, not and don't necessarily have to be on staff. You know, we're really fortunate. I have a lot of autonomy and we're a pretty big organization as far as budget is concerned um, to have Nadia on staff who's doing our multimedia um, and to have Lucy who's figuring out the best way to take that video and drop it in an email and send it to our constituents. You know, we raise money by sending the email with the video in it to, you know, 100,000 people who support us. But sure. this is the first time that they've seen a trans person talk about their experience trying to use the bathroom for four years of their high school career and how incredibly terrible that would be and and distracting like as if high school is not hard enough you know i had to walk x you know minutes and rush through classes and all of this nonsense sure. so, to the extent that we have created opportunities for people to share their narrative and share their stories and and allow themselves to be 
perceived and, and received as actual people and not just, you know, political pawns or storylines and across the aisle infighting. Um, I think that that has created an incredible opportunity for us to really just let clients tell their own stories in their own words um, and to help do that public education work sure. um, because they're telling their truth. Um, right. So that's the big difference, right? It's, it's just telling the story. It's not coming right out and saying, please click this button, please give money now for this. Totally. Yeah. Totally. We're, we're, you know, at the end of the day, Lambda is a law firm. We have a lot of challenges um, and very real regulations and rules about, you know, how we talk about things and what the way that we think about conversations with our clients. So we're also, we're also surrounded by nuance. So this idea that, you know, it's just kind of fast and loose in the digital world is not necessarily true. And that's the thing that I push back about organizations that are constantly like, well, you guys figured out how to do that, but I don't know if it'll work for me. It's like, we're operating with a lot of parameters every single day. It's a great point. So, I mean, you really do have to be aware of your market and aware of, um, what's happening in the world and, and within your particular sector, because there, are, even from a legal perspective, there are certain things that you can or cannot produce uh, to put out there. How do you plan ahead? How do you um, put together um, a process for what you, I mean, I'm sure you don't come in every day and say, let's post this today or let's post that. Do you, do you have like a content calendar? Do you, mm-hmm. how, and how far out do you plan and, and how do you arrange that? So that's part of the the challenge of creating a digital organization is like, it's so important to have digital people who have this expertise and this knowledge who are sitting at the table in other parts of the organization. So for our events team, they're planning out their 2020 calendar, you Mm -hmm. know, in 2019. So it's actually really fortuitous if a digital person is in the room because we're trying to figure out well, who on the team is going to fly to do live coverage on Instagram of that event so that we can promote the event next year, right? And sell tickets for it and get influencers and celebrities excited and engaged to want to attend this and make it look like a fun party and make it look like something that people want to attend. So it's really important that digital is a part of those conversations so that you can do the sort of forecasting that you would want to do. Of course, there's also the nimble piece of it, right? We sure. are constantly responding. Things to Things happen. Yeah. yeah absolutely. You know, the president tweets that they're going to ban trans people from the military. And it's like everything that we put in that calendar is gone now today. Like this right. is, we, we have, this is a rapid response emergency type of situation, all hands on deck. We were writing a break in, email, can we, you know, get um, trans folks that we have relationships with to speak to us on camera about what what waking up to this news felt like Mm -hmm. so that we can educate the public about how egregious and unconstitutional this is. Um, And and all the while that's happening, we have the incredible top-notch attorneys who are trying to figure out, can we build a case here? Yeah, not to uh, not to get too inside baseball, but you know, if you're a smaller shop and you're a one or two person show that's, you know, putting together this digital calendar of what you're going to plan, are there are there tools out there that can help you, you know, with auto posting and putting things together that you know will help kind of create that uh, and help you get those posts out? Because obviously, you're if you're a one or two person show, you're juggling a lot of things and and yeah, trying to get a lot of time. so you know, there's. Hootsuite and the same sort of players that have been around for the last 10 years. I think I, I kind of am analog about these things. If you're a small, like we use Google Docs so that multiple people can be in them at the same time. You so know, there are simple like, ways around. Yeah, there's like, don't, don't break the bank. You know, it's like you can get a golden hammer, but if you don't know how to hit a nail, like what difference does it make? Like, you know, people fo- like people focus on the wrong things a lot of the yeah. time because it becomes so it, it becomes easier to not sort of execute the the, the first two steps. Um, so sure. in that way, I'd say, like, just get like a Google slides and the like start thinking about four four slides of a framework that you're going to present to your manager on how you're going to take over digital strategy for your organization. And here's the ROI of it. 
Right. It doesn't cost anything. It's actually costing us something to not do it, you know, it, and, and managing that up and then starting to think about, okay, I'm going to create like a, I'm going to steal a template off of Google and, and like use it as like my five day out calendar. And then I'm going to start emailing all of the people who manage other parts of the organization where they execute things like events people or development people and say, okay, like how do we get together to figure out what you need for this event in Palm yeah. Springs in two weeks? Is, is there a way to gauge uh, how much is enough? I know you spoke before about, you know, you don't want to post a hundred things every day, but I mean, I guess it, does it depend? I mean, how, how do you know how much is enough to, to gain attention and to, to, you know, promote your, your cause. Yeah. So, I mean, there, are, so on Facebook, uh, through their insights and, and their analytics, you can, um, select other organizations that are like your organization and kind of mm -hmm. watch how often they post and sort of see if you're like trending with them or trending against them. Um, bigger shops and bigger teams are going to post more often. Um, yeah. but like that game is kind of rigged. And it's not necessarily rigged for the people who post the 100 content pieces a day. So that's an important part of this, like using Facebook as a model, just because it's one that everybody understands and is kind of like living in. Um, what we're kind of driving for at Lambda and what I think is a better model is, about, is the one that is like, is this engaging people? Are the audiences responding to it? And responses being like public responses, right? Like right. Are people fighting about this in the comments and boosting the engagement and the visibility of the post, right? So like we, we speculate wildly, digital people speculate wildly about the like algorithms of Facebook. But one thing that we know for sure is that the more people comment on a post, the more visible it becomes to mm -hmm. people in their timeline. So to the extent that you can like sort of test what kind of content is going to engage or cause a response from your constituency, those are the types of things that you can shape and use to kind of guide what you're trying to do. Sure. You know, is this like we know what content is going to be shared because we can see it. We know what our most popular pieces of content are like all of that stuff is super, super safe and like public. So you don't have to pay anything extra to see what your most shared post is. Mm -hmm. So w now that you know what that is, now you can start start thinking about, huh? What was it about that? What happened that day? When when was the moment that we posted that? Why was that particularly significant? And you start to identify the things that people are going to react to and you start to sharpen how you're messaging. Right, and can you measure that? And so that's a, a very good point. You brought it up without even me even asking, is that ROI, right? The return that you're getting on the engagement. Um, how does that translate financially for the organization? Because obviously, uh, engagement is great, but if it's not turning into, you know, dollars for the organization to grow, that's that's not helpful. Yeah, I agree. I also think that, like, to the point that I made a little bit earlier, the, there's a even more considerable ROI to not being a digital organization, which is that you're leaving money on the table. Right. Um, because we are, like it or not, most people don't, but we're in the attention game. Like, sure. Um, and this is the way that people are communicating and the radio people were mad at the TV people and the radio people dragged themselves kicking and screaming into television. Yeah. And, and this is exactly what we're seeing right now. The, the TV folks, you know, the Steven Spielbergs of the world who just don't want to let go that there's not just one way to do this. Um, <laughs> oh, you're, you're in an Instagram world where you're swiping up and uh, you're lucky if you have two seconds to uh, to grab somebody's attention. Yeah, I mean the the stat used to be that on a on a website, like on a desktop experience, you had less than ten seconds to grab somebody's attention. So that wasn't even considering how incredibly massive mobile was going to become sure. for people. So and now like, everything needs to be um, adjusted for mobile, correct? Yes, everything. You you need to be thinking about immersive design in every experience. Um, and that is like kind of a, a more complicated thing to plan for because you're also dealing with some of the limits of accessibility and challenges around um, visual impairments. And you're kind of trying to solve for, you know, does this person have a, an iPhone? Does this person have an Android? Do they have a pixel? What's happening here? Um, we use browser stack 
um, which was a tool that our last web manager introduced me to, where you can test against different kinds of browser experiences, different kinds of devices, different kinds of operating systems. And in that way, it helps you kind of identify up front the challenges you're going to have before you deploy something, right? So it's like, oh, this if this person looks on an iPhone 6 and they haven't updated their phone, they're going to have a lot of problems trying to get to this donation form. So what can we do to sort of have that conversion that we're looking for. Make it an easier experience, sure. Yeah, so I mean, I think to the dollars question, it's a tough one because if you're just building this stuff from scratch, you kind of want to have a little bit of money to burn because Mm -hmm. you need to do a little bit of testing to even see what your audience is going to respond to. It if takes you've never, time. Yeah. yeah. If you've never communicated with your constituency in this way, it's going to take a minute before they're like, huh, OK, this organization is doing something new and you're going to have to serve them those ads a couple of times. The creative is going to look weird, but you're going to get results in a way that feel very distilled. Right. Like if you split test different content and different creative across two different segments of your potential demo you're going to have a result. It's not going to be a 50-50 split. It's mm-hmm. going to be like an 80-20 type of thing. And I think it'll be helpful for you to communicate back to potential managers or or allies in this work that we're onto something here. There are people out there that are responding to this in a real way and we can build. We can build on this. Sure. I think it's also it's important to kind of get out of that feeling of FOMO uh, when you're posting yeah. things, right? I mean, I, Look, think, mistakes are going to be made, but nothing is so dramatic, I think, that where you shouldn't just put something out there and see if it works um, and, and lands for the organization. Yeah, it's um, I'm it's a weird just if like it's a it's a weird sort of tension, I think, um, because in some ways you're only as good as your next hit in the digital space. Right. Um, but at the same time, you're also like you're also wrestling with the things that people see that seem very seamless are Mm -hmm. things that went through a lot of people and took a lot of time to get to that place. So the thing where people have come up to us at events, like our team, the digital team and said, you know, that, that email that you did or, or that video was crazy or that, like, I can't believe you guys did that. Or that tweet that you sent out was so good. And that, you know, it, it went back and forth between me and Ariel and Julie a few times before it was like perfect. Um, and, and part of it is that like the mission is so strong. I think that's the thing that gets me excited about talking about this stuff, especially to like progressive cause driven organizations is the mission is already there. People are already excited about supporting you. So like, you're actually limiting yourself by not doing this work. You're right. limiting right. the opportunity for the visibility and the publicity. Like there are already journalists who are on Twitter who want to cover the things that you were doing already. So you're actually like denying yourself an opportunity. Where where would you start if you were a smaller shop, a smaller organization that maybe um, didn't even have yet a, a dedicated mm-hmm. digital manager? Um, sure. And we're just, you know, maybe you did, or maybe you just, all you have is a digital manager. How would you, how would you um, incrementally help that organization go through a metamorphosis and, and grow, uh, you know, which roles would you want to hire for? So I think, you know, I think the, the, the best answer there is that they need to call you, Jordan. They need help. <laughs> You're the best. <laughs> they need to We're gonna do this again <laughs> and talk about these things because um like this moment is passing them by. But to your point about um like the the sort of fear of taking this on is such a massive undertaking and most nonprofits are already working with too little, right? Sure. So it's like how do I take on another thing? How do I build another thing? Um I think the the person that you're looking for is the person that can distill information and make it accessible to people in a way that doesn't make them feel ashamed that they don't know anything about Twitter. Right. I'm gonna, I'm good at my job not because I've been doing digital technology and digital transformation for ten years. I'm good at my job because I can talk to my CEO mm-hmm. about it and mm-hmm. not make him feel like he's, you know, out of touch. Right. So right. the person who understands all of these things, all of these parallels, and how they 
sort of support the organization's vision and mission and overall achievements is the right person for, for a digital job. Um, at the same time, they can't be romantic about it, like to this point about you're, you're only as good as your next hit. I have had several hundred failures that nobody cares about because I have done things that have won awards, you know, it's right, silly. Sure. It's silly. Um, sure. You have to hire people who want to stare at multiple screens a day. You have to hire people who understand that this is not a nine to five. This is a 24 seven, 365. Um, you have to hire people that have to a certain extent, a, a willingness to have a thick skin in this work because working at, at this intersection um, of this climate and this accessibility to technology is difficult. Um, the same people that are going to be amplifying the, the light um, are on the other side amplifying, there are people yeah. who are amplifying the darkness and sure. that gets really exhausting every single day. Um, so, so there's a specific type of person that does this work. What what do you see trending for the future? What's I mean, things are changing obviously in technology and digital every day, every month. You know, where do you see things going for nonprofits and digital in, in the future? I think that there's a lot of opportunity around the audio space. I think podcasting is really mm -hmm. undervalued, underpriced right now. I think. Um, for all of this talk about digital kind of pulling people away from being in the moment, audio is the complete antithesis of that because people are choosing to engage with these long form pieces of content um, at, at their own discretion. So there's an incredible opportunity there to get somebody like who's already primed because if you match the content with your mission, you're going to have access to the constituency and you don't have to do the acquisition. Mm -hmm. So that's like a crazy opportunity, I think, that people are not really examining at a deep level. I think the influencer space is still very, very underpriced. There's a YouTube star like who is like, you know, five dollars a minute or something. Right. Who would bring, you know, 200,000 kids to your website over that's the next point too, finding seven. partnerships. Yeah. That's a great point. Also. Have you, has Lambda Legal or have you heard anything about AI and how that? Oh, man. I, I mean, to the extent that everybody's really scared that the robots are going to take their jobs. Yeah. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I think I, I like the idea of AI in the way that it, it sort of is a next step in like social listening and predictive analytics where you're able to collect like large swaths of data and then run it through a, a deep search and scan and have a report that comes out about this person that says whether or not they're interested in your cause and your mission. I think that that technology is still very, very highly priced and right. not accessible to most sort of small shops or mid price shops. Um, but I think as the adoption becomes more commonplace and the fear subsides, people are going to be willing to like give it a second look and see how it applies. I also think that there's an opportunity for um, a smaller shop on the AI side to come in and figure out how to make that data accessible in a smaller way. How to leverage it for, from a yeah, cost perspective. For, for yeah, for nonprofits sure. or NGOs and tell you more about your constituent than like a CRM could. Fantastic. Well, listen, as as the technology changes, let's get back together and uh, and we'll talk about it. You know how to find me. And so, Christina um, Bellarini, thank you so much. <laughs> Appreciate it. And uh, thank you to everybody for listening and watching. Uh, we're going to send a copy of this to everybody who had registered. And uh, we'll hopefully see you again soon. Take care. Awesome. Follow me on Twitter. <laughs> yes. What's your Twitter handle? Let's give it. Uh, Y2 Christina Hollick. Fantastic. And I'm at Jordan Haber. So uh, please follow us. Take care.